Hi everyone and welcome to a webinar on our citizen science expedition. Um, my name is Eva, I'm a marketing executive at Coral Expeditions and uh, my special guest today is Dr. Dean Miller, who is our co-host aboard the voyage. Um, welcome Dean. Good morning, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, very exciting to have you here today and, and most certainly um, hosting the voyage um, which is departing not too far away on the 30th of um, June. Uh, so with, let's begin. I just wanted to do a quick introduction um, to our sail safe plan. A um, little bit of uh, intro before we get into the information about the voyage itself. So Coral Expeditions um, is uh, an Australian flagged um, expedition operator who has a fleet of three vessels who are permitted to operate domestically at the moment. We're leading um, the way with our sail safe program, which has been approved by um, the federal and state governments throughout Australia to operate um, small ship expeditions. So carrying a small number of guests aboard our vessels, um, maximum of 99. On this particular voyage, we'll be working with um, the Coral Discoverer, which has a maximum of 72 passengers. Um, it's an all Australian um, passengers and crew aboard. And uh, with this plan, what it involves is um, uh, a few testing um, protocols. So beginning with a um, GP visit seven days before boarding the vessel, and then a um, three days out, a compulsory PCR test, COVID PCR test before boarding, which will have to come back negative before guests are able to board the vessel. Um, once aboard, uh, we will have, um, the vessel will have enhanced protocols aboard involving, you know, regular cleaning and um, a la carte dining. So um, all of those procedures will ensure a sort of safe travel bubble aboard the vessel itself. So we've had um, no incidents to date and um, we guests are able to travel with full confidence with those protocols in place. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dean Miller. Dean, will you please share a little bit of background about yourself for our guests, please? Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me and thanks for putting together this expedition. We are very, very excited here at Great Barrier Reef Legacy to be working with both Coral Expeditions and Australian Geographic and um, we're going to be doing some amazing things. So uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a marine biologist, a, an Australian Geographic uh, sponsored explorer a wildlife documentary maker, and recently trying my hand at a, a TV presenter. So um, I don't know if anyone saw the ABC Reef Live event, but uh, yeah, we've been broadcasting from the Great Barrier Reef, even underwater and at night. So love a challenge, absolutely love a challenge. Um, but this is a picture here of uh, myself in Greenland on an Australian Geographic expedition, sort of bringing in all those different roles together. Um, and so I've, I've done a lot of work uh, as a marine biologist in the Antarctic and the sub-Antarctic spent nearly two years down there, also in the Arctic, in Greenland, uh, Russia and Iceland. But my one true love uh, is, of course, the Great Barrier Reef, and I call Port Douglas home. So I'm looking at it right now. It's a, it's a beautiful place. Uh, and if you haven't seen the Great Barrier Reef, you definitely should. And if you've seen it, you should definitely come back again because it's just so beautiful. We're so fortunate to be uh, headquartered here in Cairns ourselves here, Coral Expeditions. So um, yes, it's a beautiful day outside and uh, just not too far away from where you're located. So very fortunate to be up this way, aren't we? Fantastic, yeah. And the Citizen Science Voyage, it's um, a first for us as a company. Um, really excited to be bringing this to our um, guests. Uh, it is a partnership voyage with Australian, the Australian Geographic Society, as Dean mentioned. Um, and this is a map indicating the itinerary, which um, given it's an expedition voyage, we are, um, it's a flexible itinerary. So what that means is that we do go with the conditions of the day, of the weather conditions. Um, but generally speaking, this is the itinerary route that we'll be following. It is a 10 night expedition and it departs um, Cairns on the 30th, as I mentioned earlier. 
Um, some expedition highlights, we'll, we'll go through these in a little bit more detail uh, in a moment. Um, but of course, uh, a great, um, a, a, one of the two major highlights is being able to swim with minke whales. Um, can't guarantee that 100%, um, but we do hope that because it is the most reliable, predictable aggregation, is that right, Dean, of, of minke whales anywhere in the world during this time of year? It so, certainly is, yeah. Look, it's, it's the only predictable aggregation of the dwarf Mickey whales anywhere on the planet. They, uh, they do occur in other areas of the world, but they are known for this uh, particular hotspot up around the Lizard Island area. Uh, they come here each roughly between late May and, um, and early sort of August. Uh, but the peak period is the exact week that we're going to be out there. So I'm super excited. I've worked with the Dwarf Mickey Whales now for the last 20 years and I've never missed a season. And there is absolutely nothing like being either in the water or seeing them uh, from the boat. Um, these, you know, six to seven metre animals that weigh around sort of eight tonnes. They're about the size of a, a minibus. And, uh, you know, the, the really exciting part about the research that we're doing um, and the, the activity is that we can actually get in the water with them should the, the conditions allow. And that is one of the most incredible things in the world to, to be in the water surrounded by this kind of lava lamp situation where you've just got these whales coming up and, and wanting to interact. It's, it's very, very special. Such a privilege and um, a very unique opportunity that few um, are able to experience. Absolutely. So I'm just going to quickly move through these highlights and, um, and I have some more slides with images for our participants. Um, so but just quickly um, tell us a little bit, a brief overview of the Coral Biobank project as well. We'll be um, surveying, working on surveying collections for the world's very first living Coral Biobank project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, that's a major, I guess, um, reason for this expedition going ahead is because uh, Coral Expeditions actually goes, uh, you know, a whole range of areas. And, and this one in particular is of interest because we're able to go out and collect corals for this living coral biobank. So the coral biobank really is uh, an opportunity to go out and collect and preserve the living biodiversity of Great Barrier Reef corals and hold them in uh, land-based holding facilities uh, in perpetuity. And corals are this amazing animal in that they can live for hundreds, if not thousands of years. We're seeing a picture here of plate corals. Now they grow quite quick, but you're seeing, you know, 10 to 15 years of growth in each one of those uh, images. But some of those big boulder corals that we can see while on the expedition, you know, if they're, you know, several meters across that, that represents hundreds of years of growth uh, on some of those really, really big colonies. So this is the perfect type of organism to have in a living coral biobank. We know about the seed bank in Svalbard, keeping the, uh, the plant seeds alive uh, or, or frozen. Um, we know about cryogenic freezing, but this is one of the only representations of a living biobank. So um, we'll actually be collecting species while we're out on this expedition and taking them back to Cairns at our holding facility. And as uh, Eva said, this is a, a, an absolute world first in the preservation of, um, of Great Barrier Reef species. So you'll be able to really, you know, watch us collect. Uh, you, you can indicate to us where you think, uh, you know, some high diversity areas will be. And that's part of the citizen science program as well. We'll be actually doing uh, reef health surveys and we'll be able to train you and you can participate in that regardless of whether you're a scuba diver or a snorkeler, or even if you just stay on the boat, uh, we, can, we can have you uh, look at some of the data on board. Um, so look, this is a really inclusive, immersive experience for science, um, which is why we're so excited about this expedition, both with Coral Expeditions and Australian Geographic. And it's bringing together this idea of lots of knowledge sharing uh, and experience and having you guys involved. Um, you know, the Dwarf Mickey Whale well Project, for instance, that we've worked on for the last 20 or so years, really relies on people's photographs and sightings of, of the animal's behaviour to try to piece together the population dynamics and the ecology of this little known species that was only discovered in the late 80s. So, you know, you, you're not just a passenger on this one. You really are getting in there and, and helping us solve some of the problems. And that's why we're, we're just so excited to really get to meet you all and, um, and have you on board. Fantastic. And very and relatively small numbers too, and um, of like-minded passengers. So that in itself is a... Um, exciting opportunity. I'm looking to flip to my next slide. Is the we have a question ready? already. Um, <laughs> Ross, sorry, your question is quite long here. So I, I might leave that till a little bit um, 
further toward the end when we have our Q&A. So thank you so much for that question. And I will come to you shortly. There we go. Whoops. Ah, so. Dean, I'll let you speak to this slide here. Yeah, so this is really representing what we're doing with the, the Living Coral Biobank. Um, and what we're doing is collecting live samples of corals, live, uh, literally live fragments. Uh, we take a portion of a coral colony out from the wild. We're not taking the whole colony, so we're not considered to be harvesting. Uh, and that colony gets taken back to a land-based facility. We cut that up into living fragments. We add a microchip so it can be uh, tracked and traced from reef all the way to uh, the tank. And those living fragments go into the biobank, uh, I guess, collection. Um, Queensland Museum then take the skeleton, they take a tissue sample and they take the genetic sample. And that goes away in uh, what will be the, the only sort of, I guess, uh, living collection of, of the corals on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so we're working with some really interesting partners. Uh, but what the exciting thing about this is that our living fragments actually double in size every six to 12 months. So our biobank will actually double. And one of the cool things about this is, you know, if you're a, a coral collector or someone who has a marine aquarium at home, then you can go on to actually uh, look after pieces of the Great Barrier Reef, live pieces uh, as part of this biobank project. So it's a massive citizen science project when you get home as well. And we've got interest from thousands of uh, marine aquatic uh, tank owners from all around the world who, who are literally just you know, so excited about looking after the Great Barrier Reef with us. That's so exciting. And um, d tell me, where will this, um, is it a sort of similar to a seed bank in that um, the coral biobank can be used to preserve coral populations in perpetuity, um, regardless of, of what happens into the future? Yeah, exactly. And because they're living samples, we can actually, uh, you know, kind of farm them up uh, and reproduce them very, very quickly. And if uh, conditions, you know, continue to worsen in, in, in the natural system, we can actually replant these out into uh, the Great Barrier Reef and other reef uh, areas. So, you know, this is a, a real kind of insurance policy. We've got an opportunity here, a, a window of opportunity to go out and collect the full biodiversity of corals. And look, we can only do that because we've got one special person who's going to be on the expedition. That's Dr. Charlie Verin. He's uh, literally the godfather of coral and the man who described, if not named, there he is in the center. Uh, he, he described and named over 20% of the world's coral species, has dived in every coral reef location around the world. And he is part of this uh, project and will be on the expedition. So he's the guy that will be underwater, uh, pointing out to our coral collector exactly which species he's chasing. Um, and we'll actually put these in the biobank. And this is the facility that it's gonna go to in Cairns. Uh, this is uh, Cairns Marine, um, where the, the living samples will be held in perpetuity. So look, this is hugely exciting. We're getting huge man media attention and support from all around the world. And this will be the first tourism, uh, I guess, uh, trip or expedition that actually brings both the science and the, the tourism aspect together. And, and yeah, we could not be more excited. And is this your project alongside Charlie um, to have conceived of the Coral Biobank? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and with our industry partners. So you can see there on the left, that's right. uh, Lyle Squires. He owns Cairns Marine and he's been, you know, kind of honing this, uh, this skill and uh, expertise for the last 30 or 40 years, collecting and distributing corals all around the world. So look, it's just a, a, a bringing together of really good um, technology skills, expertise, science to, to make this happen. We're not waiting for a, a technology gap to close. We can go and do this today. And that's exactly what we're going to do in uh, July. Huge. And this image um, that we're looking at now, this is um, what guests might be experiencing. We'll be distributing clipboards and without um, harvesting the coral themselves, it'll be a matter of um, documenting and pointing out specimens for collection. Absolutely. So we're going to, uh, I guess, um, restrict the collections to the later part of the expedition when we're closer to Cairns. That's where the holding facility is. And, you know, given that we're going to be collecting live samples, we really want them to be in the best possible condition. So it doesn't make sense to collect them on the first day and then carry them with us the whole time. So this will be towards the end of the trip. But you're absolutely right. We'll be training people how to survey reef health and look for reef health indicators out on the Great Barrier Reef and Osprey Reef. We can't forget Osprey. That's an amazing place that we're going to. Um, and what this gives us an opportunity to do 
really is um, look for further sites for, for collections. Uh, we always want to be understanding exactly where the species are. And this is why Charlie's just so important to the expedition is he can actually pinpoint where things are and, and uh, where they're not. And what we need to do is collect that full complement of uh, Great Barrier Reef species. There's about 400 or so. We have 35 species in the bank already. And our target for this expedition would be to at least add another 50 species to that. So, you know, that's an incredible feat uh, for, for our project. And uh, as you said, you know, we'll be looking to, um, I guess, passengers to help us point out areas of high biodiversity. Charlie will give talks and uh, tell people what he'll be looking for in particular. And look, there's, you know, 60 sets of eyes out there that are in addition to our own. And, and you guys are going to see much more than we ever will uh, combined. And, and so we will be relying on you to help us as much as possible. So exciting. And uh, the next slide brings me to something that's very close to my heart personally is uh, dwarf minke whales. They reach um, lengths of six to seven metres, Dean, is that correct? Yeah, a little bit bigger, um, but what we bigger. tend to see is a, an adolescent population hanging around the, uh, the Northern Great Barrier Reef here. So almost like teenagers, like a, a teenage rite of passage. Um, so yeah, they're not the full grown animals, but they're certainly, uh, you know, not the real young ones either, even though each year we are seeing more and more calves, which is very, very exciting. Um, but this is a pretty standard sight if you're on the, uh, the minke whale line. So we put a line in the water that you get to hang on to. Image uh, of that here, yeah. Yeah, and this is the, the whales coming up and approaching you and the whole I guess um, theory behind the line is that you're predictable uh, you're not moving you're not chasing the whales you're not flailing about you're actually really uh, controlled um, and the whales build up their confidence and just get closer and closer to you they're an incredibly inquisitive animal um, not only for coming up and seeing divers and they've been doing this uh, you know, for, for 20 or so years. And this is how the species got discovered because these whales continuously come up to uh, snorkeling and diving boats up in this region. And so, um, you know, they kind of said, hey, here we are, <laughs> come, and, so come moving, and have a look. And that's I imagine coming into close proximity with an animal of this um, stature, just um, I, I can only imagine what it must feel like coming eye to eye with um, a, a creature like. This. Yeah, look, it is, and it really is that eye to eye marine encounter. You know, you you kind of connecting with this really large, intelligent animal, and they are absolutely checking you out. Don't get me wrong; like they are there to see exactly what you're doing, what you're about, as much as you are about them. And uh, this is the only swim with whales permitted uh, tourism experience in the world, um, and oh. that's because. Literally, the whales won't leave the boats alone. And so, uh, you know, it's all on the whales terms. They decide how close they want to come, how long they want to stay and when they want to leave. We, we don't control the encounter at all. All we do is coordinate everyone's involvement once they're in the water or, or on the boat. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a phenomenal experience. Um, I consider this and a lot of people around the world, including some very high authorities, to be the, the greatest wildlife tourism experience on the planet. You are literally playing with you know, eight ton animals for, for hours at a time. We're, we're not bringing them in with food. We're not enticing them with anything. You know, even your own dog would probably leave uh, if you didn't feed it for a week. Uh, these guys come and play because they want to interact. And, and as a scientist, um, we, we know that there's not, there's still lots to learn about this species. What sort of um, behavior will we be, will you be tracking um, in along this voyage of, of the minke whales what we'll be looking for so we don't know where they're mating is that correct at, at this stage or what yeah absolutely no we, we don't know where they're mating um we actually uh, tagged the, the minke whales back in 2014 and I filmed this for a, a Sir David Attenborough documentary um, and what we're able to do is actually track the whales within the season uh, and, and then see them move down into the sub-Antarctic so look these are big migrator, migratory species um, they're traveling a lot and when they get to the northern Great Barrier Reef they're kind of really relaxing and, and, and uh, interacting with each other this is a very social time for these otherwise solitary whales um, but it's it's being in the water with them with everyone else with all the passengers who usually have cameras or are observing the uh, the behaviors that allows us to document the animals in space and time so these whales actually have one of the most unique uh i guess um 
patterns on their on their flanks uh, and they're, they're like finger uh, fingerprints and uh, what we can actually do is id the animal uh, according to these fingerprints and so we can see which animals have come back year after year which are interacting with other boats within the season and which whales are actually interacting with each other so by being in the water with uh, you know a, a number of people who are observing and taking photos has unlocked a lot of the mysteries of what this species actually gets up to so this is a purely tourism driven research project and uh, it's only because tourists are involved that we're able to learn so much what sort of numbers um might you expect to see on this voyage um look they'll be there no matter what uh whether we see them or not you know, depending on uh, the weather conditions is a another story uh if it's rough obviously they're harder to see they, they don't tend to you know breach very often and when they come up to breathe it's just a small sort of dorsal fin about the size of a dolphin's uh, so they're they're quite hard to spot so really we're relying on them to come to the boats and look we're on a nice big comfortable boat it will be making lots of noise and that's exactly what they're attracted to um, you know we're hanging around the uh, the ribbon reef area for you know two to three days I'd be very surprised if we don't see a whale I'd be very surprised um, but look you know, the, the most commonly seen number of whales is one and the largest amount that we've had in the water is about, you know, 25 at a time. So, you know, this this can get very interesting very quickly. It's a, it's a very special Incredible. thing. And look, don't get concerned about being in the water with a large animal, you know, like it's not like uh, being around elephants or something, for instance, that are really unpredictable and you don't know whether, you know, you're safe or not. These have to be one of the most gentle animals I've ever seen anywhere on the planet. There has never been an incident of aggression between uh, snorkelers, divers and whales, or even whales and whales. They, they seem to be so, so gentle. Is there any chance of hearing whale song? Yeah, absolutely. And look, not particularly a whale song. This is a, a very interesting whale in that they have uh, very mechanical type sounds. And for many, many years, the Navy actually thought that this whale was uh, a, a machine. Um, and that's because their vocalizations uh, are very different. They either have like a, a real grunting type of a, a sound, almost like a pig, like, and that's kind of close quarter calls between each other. And you will potentially hear that. And then uh, distance low frequency sound which is called the star wars sound because it kind of sounds like a, a a lightsaber being swung around in the movies and it's like da -da -da -ding, da -da -da -ding. so um it's a real mechanical sound so uh it's not something that you'd normally associate with a, a beautiful whale <laughs> but the sound is extraordinary it is really really cool but it's not like your standard humpback song just life-changing wow absolutely incredible opportunity this is an image of Osprey Reef. So um, for everyone out there, I'm sure you're familiar. This is uh, an, an outer reef of the Great Barrier Reef. It's an isolated seamount, some two kilometers from the seabed. Um, uh, the visibility, Dean, you mentioned to me the other day was around 100 to 150 meters. Well, the visibility is about, uh, on average, about 30 to 40 metres horizontally, but on a really good day, you can see down to 150 metre depth. Like, it, it, it is very good. Unbelievable. And it's in absolutely incredible condition because it is an outer reef and um, the life there is prolific. So um, it's a very um, rare opportunity um, for many anyway to, have, to reach Osprey Reef, I would say, unless you have your own vessel or um or are able to catch a, a a ship out like a small ship like a coral discoverer out that way yep and look it's a really really special place uh, as you said it's a coral seamount rising up from 2000 meters with almost sheer steep walls and so when we're snorkeling and diving you'll you know literally get the feeling of, of diving on a, a gigantic cliff face and and you really are um there's a really good steady population of sharks there you can see the white tip reef shark but there's also gray reef whalers uh silver tips sometimes schooling hammerheads we've had whale sharks there we've had tiger sharks we've had uh caribbean sharks you know it's a really interesting big pelagic place lots of big tuna um lots of uh potato cod and large cod species um it's kind of in my mind the, the wild west and so an opportunity to go to here uh which was really you know kind of my backyard once upon a time and i did my phd out on uh, some of these sites out at osprey um this is something to be seen i mean it's it's a world-class 
dive tourism uh, destination. Um, and the fact that we're going here, as well as all the other really cool spots, makes this uh, my perfect itinerary. I can't actually believe that we're going to tick off all of my favourite things Very in exciting. one trip. And where is the continental shelf in relation to Osprey? It's about 80 kilometers, uh, kind of uh, southwest from Osprey. So it's all on its own. And uh, I was lucky enough to take part in a, a deep water ROV expedition uh, last year. And we actually put an ROV down to about uh, 16 to 1800 meters down on Could the Could I interrupt just quickly to ask um, what an ROV is? Oh, yes, of course, a remotely operated vehicle. So uh, uh, basically an underwater robot the size of a, you know, a standard four wheel drive we sent down uh, off of the back of a, a gigantic ship, um, tethered and, and 4K video feeds. And what we actually did was uh, get to see the, the origins of Osprey Reef as well as collect uh, rock samples and, and see you know, the, the base of this incredible seamount and no one had ever done that before, uh, especially that deep. And so the discoveries that we're able to make from that expedition were absolutely phenomenal. And I'm really, really excited to be able to share that with the passengers uh, on board the ship. I've got really cool 3D models that we can look at as well as imagery that's, you know, otherwise been unseen. So um, look, this is a, a special place, you know, it drops down to 2000 meters down there. The water temperature is about six degrees and it's pure pitch black. Um, so what we're seeing is the, the literally the very top of the iceberg when we go snorkeling and diving on this amazing space. Um, there's just nothing like it. There is nothing like Osprey Reef in, in Australian Super waters. Super exciting. Super exciting. Um, and I, I guess I'll just um, talk a little bit as well about um, the importance of um, sharing this um, passion for uh, preservation of our Great Barrier Reef here in Australia and um, sharing that with guests so that they're then able to share that enthusiasm onwards and um, hopefully in that way um, participate and contribute to preservation and conservation of this incredible natural wonder we have in our backyard. Absolutely. And look, you know, uh, we always used to say the more the sea, the more you see, the more you know, and the more you know, the more you care. And that's exactly, you know, what, what some of this is about is, is going out and seeing these amazing places uh, that are still in, in fantastic condition and just saying, look, we need to do everything we can to ensure that these remain as beautiful uh, today for tomorrow for our kids, for our grandkids. Um, and that's, you know, part of collecting the reef health information, collecting the biodiversity of species, all the information that will actually collect together uh, is going to be really important to reef managers, researchers, uh, and, and of course, uh, conservationists. So um, yeah, it's an exciting expedition where we bring together a little bit of everything. And uh, we'll be working as one big team out there uh, to, to get as much information as possible. And look, I'm, I'm certain we're going to, you know, see some great things and, and find some new discoveries together. Fantastic. So I might um, jump ahead now to a Q&A. Ross, I will read your question out here for everybody. Um, the Marine Park Authority's Great Barrier, Barrier Reef Outlook Report 2019 in brief reports that the condition on the reef has deteriorated since 2000 and the 2009 original report and the 2014 update. In the executive summary, the authority states that climate change is escalating and is the most significant threat to the region's long-term outlook. It explains that the gradual sea temperature increase and extremes such as marine heat waves are the most immediate threats to the region as a whole and pose the highest risk. Sea temperature extremes caused by successive mass bleaching events in 2016 and 2017. These events led to unprecedented and widespread coral loss and flow on effects to fish and invertebrate communities. On coral discoverers, December on CD's December 2020 reef expedition, we enjoyed great diving conditions and observed what to the untrained eye looked very good, looked to be very good condition corals on Osprey and the ribbon reefs. What do trained eyes make of the condition of the reefs being visited? Dean. 
That's a really good question. And look, uh, completely agree with everything that you said in your statement. Um, you know, the Outlook report has come out. And look, the, the Great Barrier Reef is doing it tougher than it ever has. We've had three mass bleaching events in five years. Um, and we've been instrumental in, in assessing some of that impact, uh, particularly in the far northern region, and have been working on the Ribbon Reefs and Osprey Reef for the last 20 or so years. Um, there are still absolutely amazing places out there, which is exactly why you saw really good quality. Um, but you know, there are also areas of uh, high concern. Um, and so it is a little bit patchy uh, regionally um, as a, a general, I guess, uh, overlook of the Great Barrier Reef. Yes, we are concerned, which is why we're doing everything we can, which is why we're undertaking the Living Coral Biobank project so we can preserve what's out there right now. Because with each bleaching event, we're losing uh, you know, the most vulnerable corals and, and reefs. And that's really important to get out there and, and, and lock that into the future right now. Um, to a trained eye, yes, that's exactly why we're going to some of these places and doing these reef health surveys. So we're gonna actually be assessing some of the spots that we go to and working out exactly what's going on at those sites and then we'll be able to compare them to others. So look, it's a voyage of you know, discovery. It's a voyage of learning. We're bringing some absolutely you know, key people with us within our team uh, who are absolute experts in this field. And we'll be updating you every night on what we see. So it, it will kind of be science in real time. Um, you know, we'll have talks at night where, you know, we can all talk together and, and, and discuss what we saw. And I think that's a really key component of this type of expedition is that this will be something that we, we learn about on the run. And that's, that's cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Ross, for that question. Um, I have another here from Christine Kia, um, just relating to minke whales. Um, and she asks, is it best to hold the line and view the minke whales with goggles and snorkel or as opposed to just underwater diving to watch the whales? So yeah, I'll let, let you answer that, Dean. To be honest, uh, I think it's snorkeling. I really think it's snorkeling um, because you're so predictable, you're on the surface and the whales just build up their confidence. And that will be the kind of encounter that we'll be looking for. We may see them haphazardly while we're diving and that's absolutely fine. And if you do that, you know, you, you, it's like any other marine animal or animal on land. You kind of just hold your position and you don't move towards them. And uh, hopefully they'll come a little bit closer, but you know, bubbles sometimes scare them a little bit. So snorkeling really is what we'll be looking to do. Um, and when we do the snorkeling, you know, that's when you get your really close approaches. So, you know, you can have them come up to within a meter. Um, and I just haven't experienced that on, on scuba diving uh, over the years. So um, we want you to have the best possible experience. We want it to be safe, which is why we have the, the line out there, both for snorkelers and the whales. Um, and, you know, we, we've been doing this a long time and uh, we, we've been contributing to the research on this project. And the research shows that holding onto the line while snorkeling provides the best experiences. Excellent. But they are the, all of the questions I have here at the moment. But um, everyone, you're very welcome to um, send your questions in to us via Facebook and um, I will do my best along with Dean to um, return your responses online after this webinar comes to a conclusion. Um, any, any last minute questions, anyone out there? <laughs> That's all I have for now. Dean, any final words? for our participants today? Well, we got one last question there, I think. Are dwarf minke whales on the increase? Um, really good question. And we almost don't know because it's such a little known population. Um, we know it's stable, absolutely it's stable. We're not seeing a reduction in the amount of uh, whales that we're interacting with. Uh, we think there's a, a rough population of about 2000 coming to this area. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's really hard to determine, uh, you know, overall numbers. We're not seeing the adults. We're not seeing the really young ones. They're going somewhere else. You know, there are so many mysteries involved in, in, in working with these animals. It's really exciting because every time we're out there, we get more questions and answers. Um, another person said, Tracy West, uh, will we be wearing wetsuits to snorkel? Um, it's winter, um, so you don't have to. And some of the, the Southern uh, people, I don't know what your protocol is ever, <laughs> but you know, it, it's certainly not something that you, uh, I think you have to do during the winter months, but being a North Queenslander who's accustomed to the, um, the, uh, the temperatures up here, I'll be wearing a, a wetsuit because <laughs> I'm acclimatized. But the water temperature should be about 
22, 23 during, uh, during the expedition. And look, it's, it's you know, sometimes a windy time of year. So, um, you know, once you're back on board, grab a, a nice towel and go have a hot shower. You're on a beautiful boat. Um, yeah, you could not be uh, having better conditions to, to see the Great Barrier Reef than on this vessel. One extra question here from Christine Kia. Um, if I do a beginner's training so I can dive, is that all I need to participate? I would say, Christine, that you can certainly uh, participate um, just snorkeling, um, but you are very welcome to, um, to do some dive training. We, we have, um, yeah, someone on board that will be facilitating that for sure. So you can take your pick there. Yeah, absolutely. And look, you know, you see just as much snorkeling on the reef as you do, um, you know, scuba diving. I almost favor snorkeling these days because you can just move around so freely and, and just see a whole lot more. So Christine, don't be uh, concerned if you're not a scuba diver. Um, I'll be doing certainly a lot of snorkeling myself. And, you know, during the, the minky experiences, I, I will be doing, you know, exclusively snorkel unless we see them on a dive. Um, so yeah, don't feel pressured to, to be a scuba diver. Um, snorkeling will be just fine. Awesome. Okay. Have I missed any questions here? Let me have a quick look. I think that's all we have for today. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, as I said, very welcome to send any questions across to us after this webinar um, ends um, via our Facebook page. Um, and we'll make sure that those are answered and, um, and shared online as well. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. Um, incredible opportunity, our citizen science expedition um, departing not too far away. There are still a few berths left um, for those who might be um, interested in uh, still booking um, their cabin aboard. Thanks so much, Dean, for um, your time today and uh, for sharing your expertise with us all. My absolute pleasure. And um, look, I hope uh, we get to uh, meet you if you're watching and, and thinking about coming on the expedition. It's going to be a great one. I, I just know that we're, we're going to some fantastic places. And if you have a look at the itinerary, it's, it's quite varied and mixed. Uh, there's a whole swag of different experiences and, and things to do. And uh, we'll be bringing a fantastic team with us, uh, a very broad team who can, you know, explain and, uh, and, and walk you through all the research and and uh, projects that we're working on as well. So we're excited to meet you all. Wonderful. Thanks again, everybody for joining us today and, and once more to Dean. Have, enjoy the rest of your day. And um, I look forward and my, Ramona, my colleague to join you all on our next webinar. Uh, thank you so much. Bye.